All right, uh, pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Dewsbury. I am an assistant professor at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I want to let you know <clears throat> that I'm actually originally from, who wants to guess? Trinidad. <laughs> no more hints, man. She got it right on the button. So, so I actually, I like to start with that because I tell my students that first day of class. I teach a lot of freshmen in an intro bio class, and as those of you who are in the classroom know, there's that kind of paralyzing fear of the big bad professor. But when I get really excited about stuff, you know, I, I code switch. So I start talking fast and I talk a little bit like a Trini accent, a little faster. And you may not understand some of the words. So if you don't, please tell me to stop, slow down, and I'll repeat it. I won't be offended, I promise you. Um, I've been in America for 19 years, uh, got a student visa, and never left. And... <laughs> <laughs> And here I am, legally, legally. Uh, um, <laughs> but I like to start all my talks with a picture of uh, the first class that I ever taught when I was a grad student. Um, because, for a couple of reasons, I, I, when I started to teach this class, um, I was a graduate student in marine biology, and I was kind of following the very traditional route, you know, lab, 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 please don't teach too much because you need to focus on your research. Uh, this was the advice that I was given. Um, but when I walked into the classroom and had a semester with them, everything pretty much changed. And as much as I loved the marine sciences, I, I realized that I felt like my calling was to understand better how we can facilitate learning, not just in underrepresented students, but in everybody. Um, the second thing is, and we don't talk about this enough, is they taught me a lot, right? So it wasn't just I, I went and I had an ecology lab or a bio lab with them. I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot about, uh, so this is Florida International University. I learned a lot about immigration and, and what it's like to live in an immigrant family and first and second generation and having those conversations that I, I didn't have, that I didn't have to experience in my own life. And they taught me that. Um, they taught me a little bit of Spanish, <laughs> all right? Uh, they taught me what it meant to not understand how career choice is made. Um, and they taught me about things that I experienced when I was an undergraduate that I don't think I quite was able to articulate until I taught them. And I think that self-reflection process really came to be the, the basis of my practice and my research program. I'm the PI of um, a research program we call Science Education and Society. And what we are obsessed with <laughs> is really understanding the social structure of learning. Um, how does everything, your lived experience, what happens outside the classroom, what happens on campus, in the dorm rooms, how does it affect the way in which you engage in the classroom? Let me put that to you a different way. We are somewhat obsessed in all of our reports and all literature about all of the gaps in STEM learning, and underrepresented students aren't doing this, and, uh, you know, whether it's income gaps or achievement gaps, etc. But what if we would have flipped that and asked ourselves, if 50 years from now or 60 years from now, you had a classroom where there weren't equity issues, where there weren't gaps in achievement, where minority students weren't leaving STEM, what would that class look like? What would that campus look like? What are the kind of things you would say as a professor? What would you teach? Would you be doing what you're doing now? Likely not, because clearly it's not working as well as we would like it to. So we try to sort of backward design from that moment, from that vision of, of that equitable space, and try to think about what are the things we need to do right now, today, in our practice, to achieve that somewhere down the road. Today I want to take you through a, a bit of a personal story, so in a sense, so my story, obviously. Um, and tell you about my experience uh, navigating um, an intro bio class. And I say personal because I think STEM faculty in particular, we're very primed for tips. You know, we want, we want a kind of a neatly packaged um, 10 things that we can go and then do. And when we do that thing, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, the, you know, the class will become magic. And I can't stress enough today that, that teaching, I think, is a very personal thing. 
The things that have inspired me and that have informed the decisions I make in my classroom, yes, they're informed by evidence, but they're also informed by, by things that happen in my own life. And I cannot dictate what your experience and what your inspiration should be for you. So I will tell you a little bit about my story and in the hope that you can grab something from it or maybe even push yourself to reflect a bit on why you're doing what you're doing. So whether you're in a classroom or not, there has to be a why. And that why, you know, there was an inspiration poem I read recently where they said, you know, when you die, they put the year you're born and the year you, you, the year you die and a dash in between. And the dash in between the two dates is your why. All right, so what is the impact you're going to leave before you get to that day you go eight feet under? So before I arrived, it's not a hero story, but before I arrived, we had a few sections of an introductory bio class. I teach at a mostly uh, Caucasian university, um, large public research institution, um, with the state school of the state of Rhode Island. And uh, there was a big gap, uh, even though the numbers are different, but it's still a statistically different, uh, significant gap in the degree to which students got um, unproductive grades. All right? Um, unproductive grades in this context is defined as Ds, Fs, or withdrawals, meaning that they were not able to move on to the next sequence of the course. All right. Um, I don't need to belabor the point, but students of color did much, much, much worse than white students. Um, some classes that was up to like 50, 60, 70 percent, depending, some sections, sorry, depending on what, um, on how you measure it. So we were inspired by some very historical writings on, on how you kind of think about your classroom. Um, we teach an intro bio class, which is a survey type approach to biology meant to introduce freshmen to the world and wonder and glamour of the biological sciences. But you have 15 weeks and it's a three credit class. And we, we are not very much content driven. Um, we believe information is free and freely available. And our role is to teach students how to think in a scientific manner. The content is a vehicle through which we can do that. But our goal is not to cover, cover, cover. Our goal is to challenge you to think in a particular way. And to do that, we have to leverage what you bring to that space, right? We, I have to know a bit about you, how you were trained. And so the way Paolo Freire thinks about it is the art of dialoguing, actually engaging with the students in a real and authentic way. In today's verbiage, we call it active learning, and it has a nice kind of twist to it. <laughs> But we've been speaking about this for, for decades in the social science literature. So it's not actually entirely new. I've been working on a model that is actually based on a, a previous model that, that I use to kind of structure the way I approach the classroom. And you, get, you got a piece of it when I started, and that's self-awareness. Um, and I'll, today what I'll do is go through each part of the model and show you, or at least explain to you, how I've used it to inform my own approach. Um, and that, this, this part of it, I think, is a part that will be very transferable to how you can think about your practice. So I'm very self-aware. I try to own up to my biases. I try to own up to my shortcomings. I try to own up to the things that didn't work a particular semester. Um, I try to learn as much as I can about wherever I am. I try to get to know my students as well as I can so that I can empathize with their life reality so I can understand what it means to be working five jobs or being very privileged regardless of what the situation is. Um, I see this as a lifelong journey. Um, that's why I have an arrow that basically goes into the future. Um, I'm never to a point where I'm, I'm the master and expert of all things culture, <laughs> okay? Um, for example, my move to New England was a very new one to me. I'd never lived in that area, so there was a lot to learn about the history of that area. Then I started to develop a pedagogy and a teaching style based on that. What are the things I'm comfortable doing? What does the evidence say about how the brain works and how they learn, how students learn? I try to create a classroom climate that is, feels like a community. Um, all the students are in small groups, even though there's 150 students. We do very particular exercises to teach them how to work together, how to navigate conflict, how to work with difference, 
um, how to be expedient. And I try as best as I can to leverage the networks that we have on campus to enhance the learning outcomes of the class. By that I mean we have a tutoring center, so I don't just simply say, oh, well, you need help go to the tutoring center. No, the tutoring center actually has a link that's directly on my course page, and they actually have group tutoring available, and so each group can just directly make an appointment via that link. So to the student, there feels to be a direct connection between how the class is being run, all right, and places where you can get help. And that is true for any aspect of the course. And after every iteration of this class, <clears throat> we go back and refresh. We reflect. We reflect like hell. And you, you think about what worked and what didn't work. I had a former colleague who said to me that she hated teaching the same class because it gets boring. Like you kind of go on autopilot. And I never understood it. <laughs> I really do. I mean, I, I've, I'm, this is the fourth iteration of intro bio. I mean, I know four is not a lot because in 20 years it will be a lot. But... The class is just so different. You know, you look at the things that didn't work and you own up to it. I know this could have been faster. I could have graded it faster. I need to make my grading um, uh, blind. You know, all these. So every time it's different and the students are different. Um, you know, whether they're similar ethnically, they're, just, they're still different. There's a combination of the personalities are different. And so all that is part of the, the self-reflection. As I go through each of these, I'll, I'll recommend um, books and materials that I've used to help my own reflection. Um, so I encourage you to take note of them. Um, but you may have others that, that kind of speak more to the things that you want to reflect on. But these have been really, really helpful for me. I've had to confront my own biases. All right? I, for example, I grew up in a pretty conservative culture. I grew up in a conservative home. And with that growing up experience, I had a very particular view or feeling about um, homosexual culture. All right? I held that bias very strongly for a number of years before I had the courage to face up to it and understand the, the pain and the suffering that my own biases inflicted on that population because of maybe my actions. Um, I take the implicit association test every single semester. If you don't know what that is, it's actually a free online test that measures something known as implicit bias. And it might surprise you to know that for a number of years, I actually had a strong white preference. I'll let that sit with you for a couple of seconds. <laughs> but, but part of my explanation for that, I'm not trying to absolve myself here, and not to say that it's a bad thing per se, but it's not about so much the color of your skin, it's about what influences your mind. All right, and so I, I lived in a community as an undergraduate student where I saw a lot of the negative stereotypes about African-American culture being reinforced, um, and I think I internalized that. But that's an actual thing I had to confront. Um, I, uh, the book Blind Spot, by the way, is a pretty easy read that explains how the test works, um, um, explains that it's a basically a neurological consequence and not an actual intentional thing. It's by the founders of the test, Mazarin Banjani and Anthony Greenwald. I explain my own personal experience in my STEM journey. I tell my students my trajectory from Warhouse College, a historically black college in Atlanta, to FIU, um, a mainly Hispanic community in, in, in Miami, Florida, and where I am now. Um, I try to dis... Um, dissuade them from this belief that the professor always had a 4.0, okay? So yes, when I came up to physics in my second uh, year at Morehouse, that C- minus nearly made me lose my scholarship. It was pretty close. <laughs> and this could have been a very different story had that happened, okay? But you know, learn from that experience, I picked myself up, I changed my study habits, and I became better. So I share that with them, and they understand that they can do the same thing too. Um, and then I face my entrenched uh, beliefs. Um, there's some really, really good books out there that describe uh, the running conversations about not just the history of um, institutional higher education, like Michael Roth's book, um, but also the history of cultural assimilation. All right? um, this whole idea of social belonging and students of color or students who are immigrants or international trying to assimilate with a dominant culture 
is a discussion that's been taking place in the social sciences for decades. This is not new to STEM. This is not new to intro bio. All right? And there's some really good, interesting histories we can relate to and think about um, as we think about how to make our classes more inclusive. All right, so I, I strongly recommend A Different Mirror by Ronald Takaki. Um, that was very informative because he goes through a lot of very, very different groups and explains, at least from a broader perspective, how assimilation worked. Then I try to empathize as much as I can with my students, which means I have a lot of reading to do. What is the background of URI students? Most of them come from the general New England area. Um, we get a large amount from Rhode Island, but the state of Rhode Island is like the size of this room, so we get... We have other states that help kind of plug the gap. Um, and it has a really, really interesting history. Um, uh, some historians argue it's the birthplace of the revolution. And, um, but it has a very liberal history because Roger Williams ran away from Boston because they wouldn't let him preach what he wanted to preach. And, um, first Baptist church in the country is in Rhode Island, first Jewish synagogue. So it has a kind of a liberal kind of hippie bent to it. Um, but since then, there's been some very interesting migration patterns and more recent gentrification patterns that have pigeonholed communities of color into very, very particular parts of the city. So you may have some students who live in a six-block radius who've actually never seen anybody outside their race. Um, so all these things matter. When they come to a place like URI, where it's mostly white and they've never seen anything other than themselves, um, that's something I have to think of as an instructor. Um, the literature talks about stereotype threat. Um, very good book by uh, Claude Steele, which is this idea that people who are aware of a negative stereotype associated with themselves in a given situation, that just the mere awareness of that can cause decreased performance. So in my classroom of 150, I have many different groups who might be aware of negative stereotypes about themselves, and, and that may affect them. The book not only talks about the phenomenon, but it also talks about strategies as an instructor. You can make your classroom such that that phenomenon doesn't affect them. Okay. Immigration history is fascinating. I'm an immigrant, so I'm a bit kind of partial to that. <laughs> um, but at least this takes from more of a policy perspective. And uh, uh, depending on where you are, you know, the... the nature in which different immigration policies were treated um, can have real consequences to the way in which they're spread out distribution-wise in the communities. So that has been a great, important book for me to read. This is actually a fiction book, um, and the protagonist is a Nigerian young lady who migrated from Lagos to UPenn to pursue higher ed. Uh, and the reason why I, uh, I read this for me is because a lot of my students are from the African diaspora. Most are Nigerian, but there's a lot of uh, Cape Verdean, Liberian, Senegalese. And uh, their experience in America and at URI by extension very, mirrors this sort of confusion, uh, confusion between African Americans <laughs> and African Americans who were born in Africa or at least first generation. And a lot of the themes that she talks about and the way they navigate the community socially really helped me to understand the students' experience at URI. All right, so this is very, very specific to, to my group. So my teaching style, I do what I call a web-enhanced teaching model. I try to run away from buzzwords and cliche terms, not because I, I'm a hater, but just because... Sometimes when you use a term and it comes with these 10 things you have to do for that term, and then if you don't do two of the things and you say, oh, well, you're not really doing that, it's like, okay, fine. So the point of the class is the learning outcomes. That's what guides everything. And, and at different points in the semester, we may have to do different things to meet those learning outcomes. So I traditionally don't just lecture for 60 minutes every day, um, but there are times I do you know, have to give an additional explanation. In general... Students have an outside reading to do um, from the textbook, a set of questions to do before class, and an online um, uh, lecture that I spend a lot of time in the summer finding good ones. I don't like to hear myself talk, so they don't need to hear me lecture. Go on YouTube, Professor Bozeman's good, iTunes U is good. Um, and that frees the class to actually engage in problem solving. The way I look at it is this. For every single topic we talk about in biology, 
there's a really good lecture for free on YouTube. Like, very good. Not, not just somebody, you know, talking with no basis. So you really have to ask yourself, why are they coming? <laughs> All right? I mean, at some point in the future, they're going to get astute enough to think, well, I'm paying $20,000 in tuition for something I could literally get in my living room. So, so the, the, the face-to-face portion of the education model has to look at something other than expert person comes and give you, gives you information that you can't get anywhere else because you can get it somewhere else. And that's why we push the lecture outside the classroom, not just to flip it for flipping sake, but there's something more powerful I can teach you about solving problems with science. All right? We can talk about the history of it. You know, the times when we didn't make such good decisions, like when they, you know, somebody took her data to help discover the DNA molecules. This is Rosalind Franklin, by the way. And we, we talk about that as part of the lesson when we talk about DNA structure. We don't disentangle ethics from the content. We talk about Henrietta Lacks when we talk about cancer. All right? Um, I think sometimes there's a narrative, an implicit narrative about science being always good, about it's so definitive and we always have the right answer. And I think we need to own up to the mistakes and the part when, quite frankly, we used it to do things that weren't very honorable. So all that is part and parcel of the discussion. I bring in my own story. All right, I'm an Afro-Trinidadian who's married to an Ashkenazi Jew. And we got ourselves genetically tested to make sure our kids didn't have Tay-Sachs disease. Um, it's kind of weird that my kids look nothing like us. <laughs> and <laughs> so we actually do an exercise where they figure out, like, some of the traits that we tested ourselves for, if they're Mendelian, we, we kind of do an exercise for them to determine if my son, for example, will have a big head. So I have a big head. It's a dominant trait. Anyway, long story. Um, there's also a very, I, I do a very, very aggressive intervention technique. Um, and I think, you know, people sort of ask when we get good results, what's the reason? I think that's the reason. Um, the way, the metaphor I like to use is somebody speaking a foreign language. Um, I speak okay Spanish because I live 11 years in Miami, but if you started speaking to me right now, like fully, I would get the first three or four words and you might lose me by word number eight. All right? I see the semester something similar. If they don't quite get the material very well and you lose them by week three, i.e. the first exam, and you just keep going, and you didn't bother to check in to see, well, what is it that's really tripping you up? They're done, <laughs> right? Like, what, what is the strategy to get them back in the race, especially if they don't come from an educational background where there's some kind of formative experience um, to deal with resilience and to modify their study strategies and to be metacognitive about their learning? So you've already set up your course to really be tailored to people who are very, very well prepared. And I don't, I'm not with the like, oh, is it high school's fault? No, no, man, I've got the kids I have. The kids I have is the kids I have. So whoever walks in that room is going to walk out learning some really, really good bio. So that means when I get to that first intervention point, all right, meaning that, you know, we have a quiz, we have some homeworks, we have some pre-class questions and a major exam, I have a lot of data analytics in place to know, okay, right now you're at a C minus because you're not really trying hard on the pre-class questions. Right now you're at a C minus because you're doing really well on the recall questions, but when it comes to like apply and synthesize, you're struggling. Right now you're at a C minus because, okay, all of the low stakes things you're okay, but then when it comes to the 15% exams, you struggle, which means you may have some kind of test anxiety or something like that. It's actually giving me information. So when we have that conversation, it's not just, hey, man, you're not doing well. <laughs> Blank face. All right? We are, it's, it's a real conversation about something specific that they can change. Um, I put up Starfish, not because I work for them, <laughs> um, but that's the software my campus uses to send a flag if they are in academic trouble. And I give them opportunities to reflect. All right, and this is something I really learned a lot in my time in FIU where, you know, there was a bit of a blind march through degree from class to class to class with no real thought as to why they're doing this. So they write three reflection essays throughout the semester. One I shamelessly stole from NPR called This I Believe. 
There's actually a link on their website that gives educators uh, instructions and if you want to use it with your students. Um, and that, they do that first day of class. This is just tell me what you believe and why. What are you passionate about? The second is um, uh, mid-semester, a career essay on what do I want to be and why. And at the end of the semester, they write a third one called Letter to a Future Freshman to give a hypothetical future freshman advice on how they would navigate their first semester in college. Okay? All right. The classroom climate is just as important. Um, they have to feel connected to me. They have to believe what I say. They have to believe that I care. Um, a colleague of mine who's a professor of theater works with me in the summertime to work on my voice projection, um, to work on things like understanding body language. So that 50 minutes space I have on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2, it's hyper-intentional, all right? It's looking dead into the eyes of all 150 students. It's seeing in the corner of your eyes when a shoulder drops. It's seeing when somebody might be about to pull their phone out. It's kind of seeing when they're nodding along, not because they understand, but they think it's the right thing to do. I mean, all these are really, really high fine-tuned skills to kind of get the classroom feeling, feeling very, very close knit. I hold my office hours in a dorm. Um, there's a paralyzing fear for some students, especially first generation students, of going to the professor's office. So I go into their residence dorm. They have a lounge in the basement. Two hours, we order pizza, and, um, and they come see me there. And that's the dorm where most, this particular dorm is where most of my students live. For the small groups that are having academic trouble, we, we have group counseling. Um, and that's where we get into more things about how to work with teams, how to navigate conflict. Um, and that's important because I think there's a sense where, oh, active learning works. Put them in groups. Things will happen that is good. And there's not enough thought about, well, what is it exactly about working in groups that kids can learn from? And we actually make uh, things like teamwork and group work and actual learning outcome, which means that I do things to teach them how to, to work in groups. I have an assessment for it, just like any other learning outcome of the course. And last but not least, we have uh, the network leverage is when we're bringing other parts of the campus. We have a Beyond Biology series where we um, bringing the uh, Academic Enhancement Center to so the Student Services, the Multicultural Center, the Women's Center, um, the Undergrad Research Society, uh, just for like five minutes once a week to talk about how what their office does to impact, um, to help them navigate campus a bit better. Uh, last but not least, we started this sort of style of teaching in 2014. And, uh, you know, the first semester, I would say we were pretty much with everybody else. Um, second semester, we saw a little bit of improvement in terms of not just the difference between the two races, but also the overall DFW rate for both groups. Um, by fall 2015, I mean, our DFW rate was down to like 5%. All right. And also, every student of color who walked into that room walked out with at least a C plus or above. So I, I, don't, I don't belong to the school where we kind of move this an inch and tweak this and tweak that and wait 10 years and hope something to happen. This could actually happen today. It takes a lot of work, but it could actually happen. All right, and 5% is the average. The class is not easy. I don't, you know, I don't give grades, I don't curve, I don't do none of that stuff. You know, they work pretty hard, but we support every aspect of their learning. And then there's this school of thought, well, Brian, you're just kind of holding their hands and you're going to the dorms and you're pretending to be their parents, and then when they get to the higher classes, they'll just fall like flies. No, they won't. They'll be just fine. All right? So the students from my section are all the way to your far right. So there's no statistical significance between the grades, meaning that anybody from either section going on to bio 102 would do just as well regardless of the section they come from. All right? So the 18 or 20 percent who we would have lost in previous years now are staying in the major and doing just fine. We're not cuddling them. We're teaching them how to be resilient for the future. So we have this in review. We hopefully this will come out pretty soon. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the philosophy that guides my teaching, and I, and I dare say it should guide yours as well. 
Um, I'm really inspired by, by Ella Baker and this particular quote I want to put up here, not to really highlight per se the difference between black and white, but just to really underline the philosophy that teaching as a social practice is about caring about everybody. We can't outsource the problems of students of color to faculty of color. We can't outsource the problems of struggling learners to tutoring centers. We have to take it on. Like Everybody has to take it on. Everybody has to weep the same way I might when I saw those graphs at the beginning. And I really challenge you to do that. Thanks for your time.